What's good, Firestarters? Welcome to the first episode of Into the Fire, a podcast where we talk about the psychological and mental health issues that are plaguing the Argus community right now. I'm Alex, and I want to open your mind to what really goes on under the hood of creatives. Let's go. So today we're going to talk about suicide. Suicide has been very prevalent as of late. For me, when Avicii committed suicide, that was crushing. To deal with the, one of your favorite artists killing themselves, who had made so much, made so many people happy, it just completely, just mind fucked me really. And so I knew when that happened that I had to do what I could for the for the community. I have um, a long history in, in psychology and I'll go into that later. <clears throat> but I wanted to really explore today what is the impetus behind why people commit suicide, right? Like why would one want to end their life? Like there's no evolutionary purpose to that. You're supposed to live and s spread your genetics. Um, but there's a lot of reasons behind why people commit suicide that many of us don't understand. We did, we, there, the research in suicide, unfortunately, is uh, not that extensive. And so um, there needs to be more people analyzing suicide. And one of the people who I'm looking at this week who did is named Thomas Joyner. And he wrote a book called Why, Why People Die by Suicide. Thomas Joyner was one of my professors at Florida State when I was getting my master's degree in evolutionary, evolutionary psychology. He was um, in the psych department and he actually um, was the reason why I switched from going into clinical psychology and going into instead industrial and organizational psychology because I wanted to help more people. I wanted to help people on a, a larger population scale. I didn't want to work with uh, patients one-on-one. -on -one. I wanted to help groups of people. And IO psychology was uh, where he directed me to. And um, this is an amazing guy. Um, and he wrote this book, which is really amazing book because he, his, his dad actually committed suicide. And so, <clears throat> uh, a lot of it's, you can tell it's, it's, it's personal. I mean, it, it doesn't bias the book, but, um, he put a lot of heart into this and it, it comes across and it's an amazing book. And most people don't like, can't, they can't. <laughs> They don't necessarily like reading psychology books. I'm going to be your, uh, your gatekeeper in this respect that I'm going to give you the, the information from these psychology books in layman's terms. So you can understand because most of you are creatives and artists and musicians and you, you, you're not really, uh, the more academically inclined, which is totally fine. Um, I actually, <laughs> well, this is a longer story, but I, I, quit the academic life to do more musician stuff out here in LA. It's kind of funny that I'm going full circle that I'm actually incorporating more psychology into my career now. But, um, yeah, so let's get into this. It's really strange that yesterday, now yesterday, Anthony Bourdain committed suicide. Kate Spade, committed suicide this week. She's a fashion designer. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, if you don't know, um, he's he was on that travel channel, traveling across the world, trying new dishes. Um, really well-known guy. Well-loved, too, which is crazy. But uh, who else? Chris Cornell committed suicide this year. Uh, Chester from Lincoln Park committed suicide. Avicii. And, um, unfortunately the list goes on. If you looked other years, you know, I mean, it's just crazy how 2018 has been 
I mean, I can't think of any other year in my life where there's been so many public suicides, public meaning public figures. So this is becoming a major issue. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention released a study actually yesterday too. It's crazy. Um, they, found, they found that since 1999, suicide rates have increased in the U.S. by almost 30%. That's massive, guys. 30% um, increase uh, in what, 15, let's see, 17 years? Uh, that's a huge deal. So this is becoming, this is slowly becoming, I don't want, I'm not going to say epidemic, but it, it is a major issue as far as <clears throat> mortality in, in the United States. <clears throat> Men have a three to five times higher rate than women. And suicide, actually, you would think it's because of uh, serious mental health issues, and it's not. A lot of people commit suicide who were not going to see, who weren't seeing shrinks or had been diagnosed schizophrenia or bipolar uh, disorder it's kind of um, a latent phenomenon if you will I mean right like Anthony Bourdain like he <laughs> he didn't seem like he was depressed um, I mean I I don't know if I'd go the same and say Vici because he was kind of out of the limelight his last couple of years it's it I hate to say it, but it kind of comes out of nowhere sometimes and I want to really delve deep into this topic because I want all of you at, by the end of this to help someone, not necessarily help someone, but be able to pick up on signs. Because if we can all, you know, be there for each other and pick up on particular behaviors that we see in our friends, um, that'll be one step closer to really attacking this this horrible phenomenon that's going on right now um suicide is one of the top one of the, the top three causes of death that are on the rise the other are alzheimer's and drug overdoses and 40 54 percent of people who committed suicide in 2015 reportedly did not have any mental health conditions um this to me is really alarming um, because we would we would you would think that oh that they committed suicide they they had they must be diagnosed with something and not so more than half are not diagnosed so we need to as a community as a country be able to pick up on these pick up on this behavior. Far earlier on, 45% of those who commit suicide do it because of relationship problems. 50% commit suicide because of life stressors. And 33% commit suicide because of recent or impending crises. That's the stats. The stats are, are just hugely alarming. I wanted to go into that first just to give you an idea of how, much, how big of an issue uh, this is. And um, so let's go into it. <clears throat> so Thomas, I'm gonna call him Thomas. Um, I guess one of the one of the perks of becoming a grad student is you call your teachers by their first name, which was super cool for me for like two days. But it was amazing because if you know, as undergrads, we had to always call our, our professors doctor this, doctor that. Um, so I'm gonna go and call him Thomas for the rest of the time, Thomas Joyner. But Thomas says um, in his book, Why People Die by Suicide, that the truth by, about suicide may, be, may prove unsettling. It is not about weakness. It's about the fearless endurance of a certain type of pain. There's a really bad stigma that people who commit suicide are weak. Um, this has been in, in cultures, almost every culture. Um, the, the suicide is looked down upon. Uh, I, if I can recall, um, Dante's Inferno, um, in that book, the people who, uh, commit suicide, they go through the worst of the worst in the hell, the worst pain and suffering if they commit su suicide. And I'm, I don't quote me on this with, with Christianity, but, um, I'm pretty sure that 
uh, most religions look down upon suicide as well. Uh, we, it's it's just it's always looked at as that person is weak, they're selfish, and very frowned upon, and not really empathized enough, in my opinion. Um, he goes in to say, eighty families in the U.S. will lose a loved one by suicide every day, and he this book was published in two thousand seven, and he says that um, the last compelling theory of suicide appeared fifteen years prior to that. There, like I said, the, the research in suicide is still uh, not enough, in my opinion. And he really wants to tackle that and and really change the, the face of how psychology is going about looking at suicide. Because I can tell from, from his writing that he feels that uh, there has not been enough done to look at it and to prevent it, especially prevention. And the most important part about this is that I said earlier that suicide is on the rise in parallel, so to speak, with Alzheimer's disease and with drug overdoses. Difference here with suicide is that suicide is, re is totally reversible. Like if you are able to work with people in prevention and treatment, it's not like a disease that's permanent and there's no cure for it. And so uh, Thomas really wants to express that as well as a, as a clinical psychologist by heart. So I watched Avicii's documentary, True Stories, and then I read this book. And I could tell even before reading the book, I just noticed um, something was off. Something was definitely off with Avicii. Quick side story on <clears throat> why I'm discussing Avicii. Avicii was the reason I started producing music. Um, I'd always loved trance music initially. <laughs> uh, so I was always listening to State of Trance by Armin van Buren. Uh, every, every week I would download a new ASOT for like five years and I never really <clears throat> I really knew that you could produce music as with just a laptop and I just didn't really, it wasn't really something I had even considered. And then one day I heard Bromance on a state of trance, which is funny because Bromance isn't exactly a trance. Eh, it's not really trancey, but anyway, it, uh, it blew my mind. It changed everything. I remember the, where I was, when I heard it, I was in a, on, a, on the beach in uh, Siesta Key with an ex-girlfriend of mine. And I heard it in the car and I, I was like, what in the, what is, what is this? I like played it over and over and over and over. Um, and it was, it, it changed everything for me. It was such a, a chill, laid back, beautiful, hard hitting, raw s song. And I was like, I have to learn how to make this stuff. So after that, it was, it was, you know, I mean, the rest is history. I, I got logic and I moved to Ableton and I just I produced like whenever I could. And, uh, it became an obsession to the point that I do it for a living today. So that's my, my mini story in Avicii and why I have the utmost respect for that guy. And so anything I, I, I talk about in this podcast episode about him is purely out of uh, respect, admiration, and love. Um, I just want to be able to kind of solve why he committed suicide and apply that to other instances if I can, and also to apply that to the community and our society as a whole so that we can uh, notice these and prevent it from happening to others that we love. And so watching the, the, the movie, I noticed that actually two strange things. I watched an, I watched that movie and I watched um, a documentary of Kurt Cobain's. Um, and I noticed two similarities between the two. Is that one, they were crazy nervous. Like they had to the point where 
they were just they didn't want to tour they 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 both of them said they wanted to stop touring because it just what there was something that really they the, their nerves just got the best of them and they resorted to alcohol and and, and drugs to uh you know temporarily alleviate it which obviously is not a long-term solution two they both had st- severe stomach pain issues um I'm not exactly sure why Kurt Cobain had his, but Ivici had his because he was drinking so much that he, I think he got appendicitis and he had his gallbladder removed. And um, the drugs there, the his doctors were giving him were they were making him feel like crap, and he was compounding different drugs on top of each other to treat everything. And I recommend you watch the movie. It's um, it's really really eye opening, and it'll really open up um really make you understand why Vici committed suicide because i needed to know i i it was something that was really bothering me and i i had to i had to watch the movie and it really illuminated a lot of things for me the so going into the book thomas goat says that um suicidal people feel a real disconnection from others and they feel ineffective to the point of seeing themselves as a burden on others now, watching the movie, the uh, True Stories, I noticed that Avicii was feeling like he was a burden to his fans and to the promoters and the festivals that he was uh, performing for because he was in such a great deal of pain that he wanted to stop the tour. Like early on, like this last major tour, he didn't even want to complete it because he was in so much pain. Um, but he didn't want to let down his, his fans and the people who, and his con who were under contract with them. And so it was really not only physically just detrimental to him, but mentally as well. And even when he said he was retiring, you know, I remember when he said he was retiring, there were a lot of people who were pretty mad. Um, you know, like, well, who are you to, you know, they, they kind of like, thought that Avicii was being weak really because he you know if you're at that point of the of of your career when you have all the fame and the money and power and who are you to say that you can't take it right when everybody and their mother would do anything to be in his position but in reality his position was one of a lot of pain a lot of suffering physically and mentally Thomas goes to say that people uh, suicidal people desi- desire death when two fundamental needs are are frustrated to the point of extinction, namely the need to belong or to connect with others, and the need to feel effective or to influence others. I wanted to look at Kurt Cobain as well because, um, I mean, I he, Kurt Cobain was the reason that I basically got in the music period. Like I just started listening to music. Like never mind like changed i mean i don't i know that i said avici changed my life but kurt cobain like opened the door for me for music and for hard hardcore really raw um stick to your guns like real music and like to this day i am all about you know anti-mainstream really being real and expressing your true raw emotions through music and I really believe that Kurt Cobain influenced me in that regard massively. Even when uh, even when the Foo Fighters came out you know, after Kurt passed away, it, it just this raw, uncut, really from the heart music that I've always tried to uh, pass on through my music. But I'm really glad that Thomas goes into uh, Kurt's life as well in his book because um, it's really amazing that Kurt wasn't, uh, he was kind of influenced negatively through his, his lifestyle as, as a really popular artist. Actually, uh, in, the, the video, in his documentary, he said something really poignant. He said that he, his stomach pains were so bad. They were so bad, but they actually went away when he started doing drugs, which, you know, just explains it kind of his spiraling 
and uh, it, it I'll go I'll just go into it more. Uh, Thomas says Cobain was tempor temperamentally fearful, afraid of needles, afraid of heights, and afraid of guns. Through repeated exposure and practice, a person initially afraid of needles, heights, and guns later became a, a daily self-injecting drug user, someone who climbed and dangled from 30-foot scaffolding during concerts, at which times, incidentally, he would yell, I'm going to kill myself, and someone who enjoyed shooting guns. Regarding guns, Cobain initially felt that they were barbaric and wanted nothing to do with them. Later, he agreed to go with his friend to shoot guns, but would not get out of the car. On later excursions, he got out of the car, but would not touch the guns. And still on later trips, he agreed to let his friend show him how to aim and fire. Cobain died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound in 94 at the age of 27. Like, Kurt wasn't even, he hated guns. And it's just the the, the exposure, the constant exposure of, of, of being with guns. Same with, with drugs. And with this, what they, what Thomas says, a provocative lifestyle of dangling on, you know, scaffold, scaffoldings during concerts, it was just this extreme lifestyle that he kept living and that would kept exacerbating that finally came to, uh, came to a, a point where he couldn't handle, he couldn't take it anymore. So Thomas goes into saying how, uh, people who are suicidal, um, they have two two themes here. One is perceived burdensomeness, and the other is thwarted belongingness. Um, and something that I noticed with Kurt's Kurt Cobain's his documentary is that he did not feel like he was he belonged really. He thought he that people were really fake and kind of. Uh, he came. He grew up in a in a, a childhood where it was a good childhood, um, but he noticed that people were kind of fake, and he just didn't really vibe with them. And a lot of people, he didn't really vibe with most people. And um, I really feel like that sense of belongingness or lack thereof really led to his his demise. And when I'm looking at Avicii. Uh, I, I would really in the future like to um, interview some major touring DJs and get a better sense of this because I've only DJed like bars and, you know, lounges in Los Angeles. <laughs> so I don't necessarily know the life of a touring DJ as well as uh, I don't know it that well. But when you're touring in front of thousands of people on a nightly basis. I mean, they showed him, they would have like this running ticker of how many t uh, shows he was doing uh, over the course of like four years. And it was like, Jesus Christ, I, I don't want, it was like 300 a year probably. And so you're, you're going night, night by night and meeting all these people. And, but it's so, it's so fleeting and so short and so almost pretty much meaningless. I mean, they come to party and to enjoy your music and to, and you know, to basically uh, adore you and then you're gone and then you never see them again. And that has to do something to the psyche. And perhaps this is something I could go into in a, in a later uh, podcast episode <clears throat> because, you know, obviously this, 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 this doesn't happen to every major touring artist, right? But some you know why why is um chester bennington and, and um chris cornell why are these why are these people killing themselves they're in the, they're on the 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 pinnacle of their of their careers they're you know they're they're adored by by millions really but they don't feel like they're part of their fans their fan group uh, of the people who go to see them um, and that's something I would like to look into more that sort of disconnect where so many people superficially love you but how many of them actually do love you zero because none of them know you I don't know that that would be something that I would really really want to expand on uh, but Thomas goes into um, how su suicidal people they're experiencing uh, five different kinds of psychological pain. Thwarted love, ruptured relationships, assaulted self-image, fractured control, 
and excessive anger related to frustrated needs for dominance. And he, he, uh, he puts these into either perceived burdensome, burdensomeness and, or thwarted belongingness, as I mentioned uh, prior. So belongingness involves a combination of frequent interaction plus persistent caring. Um, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know when you're adored by so many people, do they really care or do they just want to listen to your music and party? Um, I don't know. That's, that's something that's, I mean, obviously it's, it's, if, if it were, uh, a thing with all artists, this, they'd all be killing themselves and they're not. So I believe that it's that plus the pain, the physical pain that Avicii was in with his, um, his stomach issues that really, um, caused his demise. And uh, it's just a shame that, um, I don't know. It, watching watching the movie, it's not like he was hiding it either. It's just that I think that his his cohort and the people around him didn't. Hmm, this is a tough one. I don't want to. They, they they definitely cared cared for him, but I don't think they they really they fully understood how much pain he was in. Um, and I don't think, I don't think it's anybody's fault. I just, uh, I think there might've been a disconnect of communication, if you will. So the need to belong, uh, is only partially met if an individual feels cared, but does not have face to face interactions. And I could, I could see that as a touring artist, not really having these personal face to face interactions. It's just a sea of people. Suicidal individuals may experience interactions that do not satisfy their need to belong e.g. relationships that are unpleasant, unstable, infrequent, or without proximity, or may not feel connected to others and cared about. And Thomas says, the perspective taken here proposes that feelings of ineffectiveness contribute to the desire for suicide, and moreover, that feeling ineffective to the degree that others are burdened is among the strongest sources of all the desire for suicide. And I can't help watching true stories but think that Avicii did see himself as a burden and that he was letting people down. He, you know, like he had, he was on the headline for a lot of festivals and he couldn't just, the, those festivals would probably would, I wouldn't say they, they'd, they would have to fold, but it would be a major, it would be a massive deal for them. And for thousands of people who bought tickets, if he were to back out. And so he could, he couldn't. And, it's just, uh, it, it really took its toll on him. And Thomas says, those who, f who view themselves as a burden on others have a negative self-image, feel out of control of their lives, and possess a range of negative emotions stemming from the sense that their incapacity spills over to affect others besides themselves. When you let your group down, you experience all the negative aspects of letting yourself down because you're a part of the group but you also experience a sense that your ineffectiveness is not contained, that it negatively, negatively affects others. Suicidal individuals perceive that this ineffectiveness that negatively affects everyone is stable and permanent, forcing a choice between continued perceptions of burdening others and escalating feelings of shame on the one hand or death on the other hand. So, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want this podcast episode just to be about uh, why Avicii did what he did. It's just um, something that's really personal to me. Uh, and I feel like I would it would behoove me to talk about it, at least a good part of the podcast, because his music just was so influential to me. And I, I as a as a psychologist by trade, I want to uh, I want to figure this shit out. And so that's going to really be the impetus for this whole podcast is that I want to I want to talk about the, the issues that people aren't talking about because they're afraid or because they just want to look the other way and I say fuck that we need to look this shit in the eye and figure out what's going on and I really want to I don't want to see another one of my favorite artists kill themselves like point blank I don't want to see this anymore